Hi, I'm Maddie Orton, and this is The Arts Project. Here's what's on tap. Ballet takes a turn in gym class. I sit down with star of Chicago and Cheers, Jersey girl, B.B. Neuwirth. Art offers a window into history. And the beginning of a beautiful friendship. It's all ahead on The Arts Project. Thanks for joining us. Now, when you picture phys ed, you may imagine dodgeball, laps around the track, and weight training. But for the city of New Brunswick's third graders, it's also hip hop and ballet that get them moving. For the last several weeks, American Repertory Ballet has put their spin on gym class. Now the big night has arrived as New Brunswick's third graders take the state theater stage to show off the moves they learned from the Dance Power program. It is a collaboration uh, that's directly with the physical education teacher. It's really about strength, it's really about agility. Um, so these are all things that make sense when you're thinking about what they're trying to do in the phys ed classroom. This 20 week in school residency teaches ballet technique, dance history, and choreography to be performed at the end of the program for family and friends. And we've received all types of different reactions to very excited versus I don't like dance, this is not what I do. We just really hope at the end of 20 weeks those feelings all become very much positive and for the most part they really are. What we really try to include in the curriculum um, as well as verbally through the teaching artists is that dancers are athletes. Mm -hmm. um, we tell them that um, football players take dance class. Mikhail Baryshnikov could jump five to six feet in the air. Basketball players typically only jump two to three. Vitozo hopes Dance Power offers an alternative entryway to an active lifestyle for kids who may not be as interested in sports. You know, basically when we think about dance, we also always think about just the health component. Uh, obesity is a problem in this country with children, so just getting them to understand that there are different ways to be active is also mm -hmm. really important. While health and fun are at the heart of the program, there's a competitive element as well. 32 students are selected to receive scholarships for free ballet training through 12th grade from American Repertory Ballet and the Princeton Ballet School. So it's a big game changer. Dance classes are very expensive mm -hmm. and they're actually getting obviously a free dance education for basically their entire you know, school life. We look for the dancers that have that drive, who really want to be there. That doesn't mean that they're going to have the very perfect first position or the perfect plie, but we really look for those dancers who are very much passionate. Sarah Garcia was a Dance Power Scholarship winner. Now in 10th grade, she's turning her attention to colleges with strong dance programs. The people that I've met, like I could have never imagined without the scholarship. Like my best friend I've met because of this. Um, and to have the teachers, they're, <laughs> they're amazing. But even those who don't continue with ballet will take away lessons from Dance Power's training. Just the idea of just listening, paying attention, following directions. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not, doesn't have to be just in dance, but you're going to need that in all your life skills. For many, though, these 20 weeks of dance can instill or cement a lifelong love of the art form. Ballet's, um, I like it because... There's a lot of moves that I like. Scholarship recipients like Romani will continue their training with the company at the beginning of the next school year, just as a new group of students begin practicing their plies. American Repertory Ballet has a history of turning out talent, like our guest, Princeton native B.B. Neuwirth. She's an Emmy winner for her role as Lilith on Cheers and a two-time Tony winner for the revivals of Chicago and Sweet Charity. Now Neworth adds another award to her collection at this year's Garden State Film Festival in Atlantic City. Phoebe, thank you so much for being here. And uh, congratulations on your Wave of Excellence Award from the Garden State Film Festival. Thank you very much. So I, I know that you consider yourself first and foremost a dancer, mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask how you got uh, interested in that. Um, I don't know. What, when I was four <laughs> years old, I think I saw a ballet when I was four, and I said I want to do that and I wanted to go to ballet class and um, because my mother wanted me to 
stick with it because she loved ballet also. She had me wait till I was five because a five-year-old has a longer attention span than a four-year-old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I started going to uh, ballet class when I was five. And so 50 years later, I'm still going to ballet class. That's wonderful. And I understand you took classes with um, what was formerly Princeton Ballet Society and it is now American Repertory Ballet. Yes, the Princeton Ballet Society yes. was, um, again, because um, my mother had some very bad training when she was a young girl. Hmm. Um, she had some really bad <laughs> ballet training and later had some good training, but because she knew the difference, um, she wanted to make, sh she looked for a very good school. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to have happen to me what happened to her when she was little. So. Um, Thankfully, the Princeton uh, Ballet Society was right there in our hometown, and so I started going to take class there. And so when I was about 12, I got into the junior company and stayed in it until I was 17 and graduated from high school. But mm. what it did was, not only did I have fantastic teachers at the Princeton Ballet Society, I also was in a company um, the regional company, mm -hmm. and and therefore had a lot of performance experience. Hmm. And obviously, I mean, of course, you stuck with it with your performance career. But yeah. I mean, did it help you beyond that with other aspects of I your life? I believe I believe that uh, dance class, mm -hmm. uh, even if you don't get to perform, but just being in a ballet class or a dance class, if it's a good one with mm -hmm. a really good teacher. Um, is very helpful for no matter what your walk of life you choose. You learn to work in a group, mm -hmm. you learn respect for your colleagues, sure. and you learn respect for your teacher. Um, because in a really good ballet class, there's a protocol there. Mm -hmm. You have to dress a certain way with respect for the place. Um, you have to, if you're standing at the bar and you're doing grand battement, well, if somebody's right in front of you, you're going to have to turn slightly <laughs> so that you don't kick them. Well, I think we can extrapolate and take that out into society <laughs> where, Absolutely. you know, I wish more people had taken ballet class. <laughs> Sometimes we can crossing the street in New York City, I'd like, world. yes, I Absolutely. think so. Yes. I read something that you had a, a bit of a career epiphany when you were 13 uh, and saw Pippin. Yes. What, what was it about Fox's choreography that really drew you? Well, um, if I can just, if I can frame this for you. Sure. Um, when I wanted to be a professional ballet dancer. Mm -hmm. At about, when I was about 13 years old, it was becoming clear to me on a very subconscious level, conscious, subconscious level that I didn't want to look at, that that wasn't going to happen for me. I was a really good dancer, sure. but I didn't have that really ferocious ballet, tech, mm -hmm. strong ballet technique. Fortunately, by the grace of karma, I was <laughs> taken to see Pippin on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, and I saw those dancers doing that choreography, and Ben Vereen, mm. and all those spectacular women, I, I felt like I was seeing myself on the stage. Interesting. <laughs> in a, in a, in a non-egotistical way. Sure. Because it sounds like that, but it really wasn't. <laughs> it was just that choreography and that world resonated so deeply for me, and I felt mm. like, I feel that choreography. I know what that is. That's me. I can do that. And it was very fortunate because, as I say, at about that time, I was realizing I wasn't, probably was not going to be a professional ballet dancer, but mm. oh, look at that. I can do that. I want to dance on Broadway. I want to do that guy's choreography. Wow. So I made this shift in my consciousness and unconsciousness that that's what I was going to do. If you ask me what what it was specifically, mm -hmm. I don't know. I can't hmm. tell you. It was a wordless um, draw. It was that world. There was something about the elegance, maybe. Sure. There was something about the sensuality. Mm -hmm. There was something about the irony and the humor and the darkness. I don't, I don't know, but it was all that world that made sense and helped me know who I am and as so an artist. You got to work with Fosse later. I mean, what was that yes. like? Yes. I, I just loved him yeah. so much. Um, 
you know, it was a case of when you actually get to meet the artists, sometimes they can be really disappointing, sure. the ones that you revere. And in this case, it was, no, he was, he was a great man, and I, and I just loved working every second working for him. I just lapped it all up That's and so he just spoke in truth and with great sensitivity and clarity of vision. I felt like if you just do what he says, if you pay <laughs> attention and you do what he says, you will always do the very best work of your life. Wow. And certainly that's that's how it felt for me. And, and I know that you just closed your third stint on <laughs> Chicago, which is amazing to me. So you've now played, you've played Velma, you've played uh, Roxy and Mama Morton. Yes. What, what did that feel like? <laughs> I, I, that was crazy. Yeah. That was really surreal. So fun. And again, very moving. Um, Chicago, I saw Chicago when I was 15. Mm -hmm. I saw Gwen Verdon and Cheetah Rivera and Jerry Orbach and all the rest of them. And uh, it meant a lot to me sure. to, to one day open in the revival as Velma Kelly, uh, the great Cheetah Rivera's role. Mm. And then some years later, I went back and played Roxy. and explored the show from another point of view and expanded on my consciousness of what that world and that show was like. And to come back another seven years <laughs> later, <laughs> the show is in its 18th year, sure. so it's pretty unusual to be able to do this. To come back and play Mama Morton mm. was very moving to me uh. and very surreal because not, you know, muscle memory, Mm -hmm. I, I remember all my choreography <laughs> from the other parts, but I also remember my cues backstage. You know, when you're in your dressing room and you go, oh, I gotta get on stage. No, I don't. I'm not in that part. And then you say, oh, I gotta go. No, I'm not in that. I go, I gotta go now. Yes, I'm in this. Nice. So I remembered running to the wings oh, at times when I wasn't. That's amazing. <laughs> Very and so, surreal. Of course, we should, we should absolutely talk about Cheers and Frasier. <clears throat> okay. I understand that you were brought on to do one scene in Cheers yes. and then ended up with a character that stuck with you for years. <laughs> yes. How did that happen? Well, I was uh, called in to do one scene of a date that went badly for <laughs> the uh, Kelsey Grammer's role of Frasier. Sure. He, um, he went on a date with a psychiatrist who, and the date went very badly. I, my understanding is they thought, well, you know, it's really interesting to link Frazier up with someone who is his intellectual equal. Sure. And who calls him on his, <laughs> you know, on, on his stuff. So they started to develop my character, mm -hmm. Lilith, with with Frazier, and then it just kept going and going and going. And through the brilliance of their writers and producers, mm -hmm. they saw what they could do and how they could expand that role and that relationship, keeping it real, keeping it true to the characters. You're also here for a film that you worked on. Can you tell me a bit about uh, Jerome's bouquet? <laughs> well, my husband, Chris Calkins, had an idea. So we went on Kickstarter, raised mm -hmm. money, and made a short film that was Chris's script mm -hmm. and then Chris as I say is also a photographer so he directed the camera and the shots mm -hmm. and I directed the actors oh. and I had a fantastic time. I'm so sorry that we have to go because I, I could talk to you forever. We could talk for a long time right? <laughs> oh but it was such a pleasure thank you thank so you. much for doing this and, and congratulations me. such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so thank much you. same here. And fun fact the film star is Suzanne Shepard. She's Calkin's stepmother, New Earth's former acting teacher, and the matchmaker who brought them together. Casablanca is consistently listed as one of the greatest films of all time, thanks to Bogie's performance, a stirring story, and an iconic score. Last season, New Jersey Symphony Orchestra brought the music of Rick's Cafe into NJ Pack's concert hall in a first-of-its-kind event for the symphony. <laughs> Hundreds of audience members poured into New Jersey Performing Arts Center to see a classic romantic film as they've never seen it before. 
accompanied by a live orchestra in New Jersey Symphony Orchestra's concert of the score to Casablanca. I think this is a great way to introduce new audiences to the sound, the thrilling sound of a live orchestra. Nationwide, symphonies are contending with declining attendance, and organizations like New Jersey Symphony Orchestra are looking to diversify the kind of concerts they present. We try to be very engaging with our audiences. We talk about raising the invisible curtain so that we're more approachable. Symphonies are finding new ways to build audiences for orchestral music, and NJSO hopes that programming like Casablanca will do just that. This season, the symphony is including concerts like Cirque de la Symphony, a performance which will feature acrobats, along with more classical works. Our musicians and our music director um, try to engage with the audiences. We speak to them during the concert. Our musicians are actually go out in the lobby at intermission to talk to the audience, take their questions, so they can connect more deeply with the music. This programming offers musicians a different way to connect with the music as well. To study for this, I actually checked out Casablanca, and I went through the and I went through with the music, and I was astonished that you actually. Uh, can't hear a lot of the or orchestration in the actual movie. So I think the audience will discover some new pieces of music in the movie. And the score is by Max Steiner. And Max Steiner, who also wrote and scored Gone with the Wind, was actually a student, a composition student, student of Gustav Mahler. Playing alongside a film does provide added challenges for the orchestra. I have a couple of uh, video monitors in front of me. One of them has the film, so I can watch the film on one side. On the other side, I have an, uh, just a regular analog clock. Well, it's really challenging because we have to be right on the clock, right with the movie. The movie just goes, and there's no wiggle room. The other challenge for me is not to watch the movie while I'm playing because <laughs> it's right there, and I still have to concentrate on the music. To facilitate performance of the score, the orchestral track has been removed from the film. All the famous stuff is on there, and we will be playing with them on the screen. So it'll be kind of like a, a duet between orchestra and movie. And while that duet may be an intricate one, New Jersey Symphony Orchestra suggests the payoff is worthwhile. Well, I think especially hearing the, the, the score live, kind of enhances the emotional impact of the score. We're usually not very aware of what's going on with the music in movies, but the mu music is always there kind of shaping things behind the, the action, behind the dialogue. It's about a girl who had just come to Paris for her home in Oslo. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I think that I'm noting the music a lot more than I would have otherwise. New Jersey Symphony Orchestra takes on another classic at the end of the month with their accompaniment to The Wizard of Oz. Don't forget to tweet the art that you see, perform, and create at a hashtag TheArtsProjectNJTV. Now explaining the unexplainable to children. This artist tapped into his use of color and cartooning to present Holocaust history in a way kids can understand. And as Holocaust Remembrance Day approaches, I want to share with you his creations of art for education. Eye-catching colors and detailed streetscapes full of expressive faces lined the walls of the George Siegel Gallery at Montclair University. Murals that might at first glance appear to be for children's entertainment are, upon closer look, a teaching tool in disguise. The beauty of this artwork is you see scenes like that. It really brings a little bit of a human dimension and, and, and it allows people to get a better sense of really what went on. <laughs> Artist Israel Birnbaum created these colorful canvases. Birnbaum fled his home in the Warsaw Ghetto at 18, just as Hitler invaded Poland. He was separated from his family and sent to Siberia, never to see them again. 
Inside the barbed wire lined walls of the ghetto, 300,000 Jews were either murdered or deported to forced labor camps. After the war, he uh, was sent back to Warsaw only to see the devastation. He knew all about the street. He grew up there. He could not find the old people that were there or the young people that were there. The Warsaw Ghetto was the site of the 1943 Jewish uprising. On the eve of Passover, police and SS officers entered the ghetto with plans to continue deportation of residents to death camps. They were ambushed by resistance fighters, armed with stockpiled grenades and guns. You had people packed into, an, I think, an 18-block area with basically no source of, of munitions or arms, and they were able to hold off uh, you know, the German army almost as long as Belgium and France. But the Warsaw Ghetto stands out as a symbol of, of really Jewish pride, Jewish backbone. But despite heroic efforts, the ghetto and nearly everyone in it was destroyed. Out of this atrocity came a mission for Birnbaum. He said he was going to um, do something so that the next generation will understand and remember what happened. That is the beginning of uh, my brother's keeper. He hoped the cartoon-like quality of his murals, included as illustrations in his book, My Brother's Keeper, would present history in a format children could better understand. A picture is worth a thousand words. Um, the work is uh, it's primitive in style. It's very colorful, so it's, it's very easy for, um, this, uh, for a young person to absorb. A child can come in here and relate to this. The art relates to you. That's, that's the beauty of it. And from the art, exhibition organizers hoped audiences would remember and learn. Let's just understand what happened and, and so that people will not uh, do it again. This is something that, that they can learn from and, and they can share with their family and hopefully it will leave an indelible mark on in them for the future and help make you know, the world a better place. The Jungle Book gets a moving makeover in the world premiere of Roxy Ballet Company's Mowgli. At the Bickford Theatre, a guy group from the 60s is sent back to Earth for one more chance at a career cut short in the musical Forever Plaid. And Wheaton Arts highlights New Jersey artists and craftsmen at their 7th annual Eco Fair. The boys of summer are back. Earlier this season, Crossroads Theatre Company took a look at one of the greats who made baseball what it is today. Here's the windup. Oh, yes, and he lets it fly. This season, Crossroads Theatre Company paid homage to a man who helped change the game forever, Satchel Paige, in the professional world premiere of Kansas City Swing. He was arguably one of the best uh, pitchers of his era, um, or, or any era. At the time, he was sort of the king of the Negro Leagues, uh, doing, you know, running his own teams, being shipped to other teams to just play like a game or a few innings. Oh, it's a chapter in history that, like a lot of chapters, is not written in books. It's not written in the history books, and so we have to do it ourselves. Khan has experience in this arena. In 1978, he co-founded Crossroads Theatre Company, which is committed to creating and producing works that examine the African-American experience. The company was awarded the Tony for Outstanding Regional Theatre in 1999. Here at Crossroads, and our name suggests Crossroads is the coming together of people from many different backgrounds to experience one thing. And this season, one of those experiences is the story of Satchel Paige. Khan and co-playwright Trey Ellis worked closely with the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City to accurately depict baseball in 1947, the year the play takes place. Wool uniforms with button flies, team logos from the time, and Paige's pitching form and style of speaking are infused into the show for authenticity. Work like you don't need the money. Love, you ain't never been hurt. Dance, nobody watch. As you know, that baseball fans are crazily particular about every specific. So I was really, I made sure, I just hear in my head when I'm writing something, this better be right. Audience member Robert Scott would know. Scott pitched for the Black Yankees from 1946 to 1950. And seeing this story told is especially important to him. It's wonderful because 
people need to know. You need to know about history. History make you be a better person. The Negro League was a major league, so we had major league baseball players. Only difference between the, the major league and the, and the Negro League is the color of the skin. As for Satchel Paige's story, Scott witnessed it firsthand. Satchel Paige was so good that when he, when, he, when he threw his pitch, I was going like this, and the catcher was throwing the ball back, back to, to the pitcher. I never, get a, I never got a chance to swing the bat. For the production team of Kansas City Swing, it's an honor to tell this story the best way they know how, through theater. I feel like with all stories of legendary heroes like this that go unsung for as long as he have has, you um, you know it's it's about time I guess and uh, and it's just awesome like to be able to be the one to do it. He's the oldest rookie in baseball and the first Negro to ever take the mound. When things change, we forget how things used to be, and I think this really speaks to the world today and how we got there. End of an era, as they say. There's a hell of a lot more than that. I hear you, man. Thanks for watching. On this and every episode, we bring you music by some of New Jersey's finest. Today's featured music is by Manny Sounds out of Highland Park. I'm Maddie Orton. See you next time as we continue touring the Garden State for all things art.